Hello, my name is Mark Gooden. I'm a CFD engineer with Simitech Group. For this tips and tricks video, I'd like to show you how to set up a linearly expanding mesh example model incorporating a mass source at a boundary using ANSYS CFX. This work builds upon another tips and tricks video that I created where we prescribed the motion of this green face as a rectangular fluid volume, prescribed the motion in the y direction as a function of time. And to review the uh, information in that video, this video builds upon another tips and tricks video that I created where we prescribe the motion of a mesh here in, in the y direction as a function of time. And there's information in that video on how to set up and run this, this type of model. If we want to look at the, the mesh deformation for that example, it's shown here. Well, again, what we're doing, we're just moving this green face in the y direction and linearly expanding all the elements in between. So what I thought was really interesting about this case is that we're, uh, these are monitor values from this prescribed mesh motion model. And on the left we're plotting the domain length change versus time, and on the right the domain mass versus time. And what's really interesting is that, you know, of course as we're adding length, we're also enlarging the fluid volume. But then by adding, enlarging that fluid volume, we're intrinsically adding mass to our fluid domains. There isn't any inlets, outlets, just by expanding the volume for this constant density fluid, we're adding mass to our, to our system. So what I wanted to do is create a model which is more, let's say, physically uh, representative or meaningful, where we're gonna, going to drive the mesh motion by a mass source at a boundary. And we can do that using expressions. So what I've, done, I've listed here is the, the equations that we'll be using. So our mass flow rate, of course, is the fluid density times the mesh velocity times the cross-sectional area of that rectangular section. And then another way of writing that is to replace the mesh velocity by the total displacement over the total time. And then if we kind of rearrange this equation, we come to the change in length relative to the initial position is equal to the mass flow rate times the local time step, times the time step number, again, divided by the density and the cross-sectional area. So if you look at the expressions here, we're calling out the cross-sectional area. We have our end time of two seconds. The fluid density is set at 997 for water. It's, a, it's important to set this as a constant value here uh, and not use density as one of the variables because density is not a singular value. And so a way to, to kind of get around that and allow the expression to be solved is to actually prescribe the, the fluid density for this, for this material. And I, we have our time step size, 0.05 seconds, and total displacement of 10 millimeters. And what you'll notice is we, I've left in the linear increase expression as, as, as a reference where we have the local time divided by the total time times your displacement. But what we're going to be doing now is we're going to calculate this mass source flow rate, which is the Again, the total displacement divided by the total time times our density times our cross-sectional area. Then with this value, we then can calculate our expansion mass source. And this is in kilograms per second. So we have the mass source flow rate times our time step times CT step. And what that is, that's the current time step number, again, divided by fluid density and cross-sectional area. So to create this mass source on a boundary, within CFX, what we do is we go to the low Y phase, which is our stationary phase. We toggle on boundary source, we toggle on sources, toggle on continuity here again. Our option is total fluid mass source. Um, and now that what we then select is the mass source flow rate. This again is in kilograms per second. And then our velocities, what we're selecting is they're determined from the, the mass flux. So now if we look at the results here, this is the total mesh Y displacement this is an animation, this is a uh, keyframe animation from zero to two seconds. And we can see as the time proceeds, our total mesh displacement increases. It'll be up to 10 seconds and it'll be symmetric once we reach that final time step. There we go, that looks good. Let's also look at these are contours of velocity magnitude versus time. And we'll see how that, how that looks. In the mesh, what's interesting here is the higher velocity is in the center, which is what you expect. This is the low Y wall over here at the left, so it's all stationary. Velocity goes to zero. 
on the high y wall, velocity is non zero, it's moving with the mesh. And so this high flow region is centered within the core and you know, furthest from the walls and skewed towards the high y because, um, because the velocities there are non zero. So now within CFX, let's touch on some key points in setting up this mesh motion model. First, under analysis type, Notice we've used expressions to define the total time of the simulation and the time step for, for this model. To, to define the expression, we right mouse click in the white box and select expressions and then select the expression for that particular input. Next, let's open up the fluid domain. The key points here is we've selected water. Remember, we've, we've defined a constant density for that water under the material definitions area. We've also under mesh deformation, we selected regions of motion specified and relative displacement to initial mesh. If we expand out the mesh motion model, we'll see we're using a displacement diffusion method. Under mesh stiffness options, there's several different options. These are discussed in more detail in the other video on the linear mesh motion. Here we're going to set a constant value of one, so uniform stretching of that mesh as the model expands. In the fluid models, we just run in with laminar. Initialization is important. Here we're setting all the velocities to zero and our, our static pressure at one atmosphere. Next, I'd like to open up the solver control. So, key things here under control, convergence control, we define a minimum coefficient loops of three. Default is one. We want it to go through at least a number of these coefficient loops before moving on to the next time step. I've tightened up the convergence controls from 10 to the minus 4, 1e e 10 to the minus 4 to 1e e 10 to the minus 5, our residual target and our conservation target, a mass of 0.1%. Another important parameter to, to consider and possibly control or tighten up is under mesh displacement. Here again, I've, I've required a minimum of three coefficient loops, maximum of 10, and I've changed from the default RMS residual target of 1e to the minus 4 and 1e to the minus 5. It's very important that we provide tight convergence of the mesh at each different mesh time step before proceeding on to the next displacement. Next, let's open up our low y face selected here. This is the face under boundary details. It's no slip stationary, but here is where we apply our boundary source. We've toggled on boundary source, we've toggled on sources. We selected, there's two options here. There's fluid mass flux, which is your mass flow per unit area. Here I've selected just total fluid mass source. That units for that are in kilograms per second. Again, I'm using an expression, our mass source flow rate for that definition. Under the velocity options, I've selected determine for mass flux. So it's a velocity that's going to be proportional to the mass flux. Other, another option which you might want to consider is the Cartesian vector components, where you could specify the velocity normal to a face based on that mass flow rate. You could then have the velocities in the other directions, which could potentially impart a swirl to your mass coming into that boundary. But here we're going to keep it determined for mass flux. We have our expressions down here. We double click, which we saw previously. We have our, our constants, and then we have our expansion mass source, which really drives the expansion of this upper Y wall as a function of time. So now let's close out of CFX Pre and run our simulation. The simulation, we double click on the solution branch, it starts up the CFX Solver Manager. Point here is we want to select double precision. Again, we want to precisely control or converge at each time step the displacement of our mesh. So we always toggle on double precision. Here I'm going to go ahead and parallel. And then our initial values, I like to select initial conditions. And then we start our run. Run starts up. I'm going to load in a workspace that I created previously. Open that up. But what a workspace is, is when you create different monitor values or, or 
tabs that you like to have for your following simulations, you can save those as, as, as workspace. So to do that, if you want to create a new tab, we run, it runs complete already. Uh, you right mouse click in the gray space here, you say new monitor. Let's keep it plot monitor one for a name. The user point, we turn on domain mass and then say apply. But we've already done that. So what I've done is you have user points which comes in automatically to help you monitor your simulations. Um, but I created a separate one so I could look at just the domain mass. I could look at the domain overall length and I could look at my imbalances. And so um, it's a really nice way to, to monitor and keep track of each of your variables that are of interest to you. So let's close out of the solution, which is completed, and open up CFD Post. So we'll click on Results. So now with, with CFD Post open, um, notice we've got our velocity here. It came in in meters per second. Let's change that. Go to Variables. Go down here to Velocity. We like to see velocity in uh, millimeters per second. There we go. So this is this very similar image to what we showed previously with the animation. This is a time of two seconds. This is our time step selector. So we, we, select, we select that and you can vary your time here. We double click the time zero for our starting point, time point six and so on. Um, and what I'd like to show you is, we'll go back to time zero, is how to use, create an animation. And here, the type of animation we're going to create is a keyframe animation. And to do that, we select this little new icon here. And what it does, it loads in this, this image that we currently have on the screen. And then we're going to load, that's time zero, and then we're going to load in the final time of two seconds. But notice it's the 21st loaded step. So what I do for number of frames, I'm going to change that to 19. And then when we load in the final time step, you'll notice we're at time frame 21. We want one frame following that last uh, the last frame. So change that to one. We're going to change our movie type to MPEG. We're going to create a new name for this. It's movie file. Under options, it's important to change or to select your options and change the time. So right now this simulation, this animation would run in about a second. We want to slow that down. Let's make that maybe uh, 15. So now it'll be about 13 seconds to run the whole animation, which is a lot more reasonable. We'll change the image size to, to HD video 1080. And I like to change the quality to, to high. That should be adequate for what we're doing. Um, and the last step would be just to rewind. We rewind back to time zero. We're ready to play our animation. So we just hit the play button, and then we'll be creating that uh, that MPEG movie file. Um, so that's uh, one of the key things we do with these transient simulations. I hope you found this tips and tricks video helpful. Good luck with your simulations.